Welcome, everyone. It's great to have you all back for this edition of Let's Talk Art. And tonight, I'm joined by my colleague, Manager of Collections and Exhibitions, Sarah Wolf. Hello, everyone. And tonight, we're going to be talking to you about the special exhibition that we have on through October 17th called Treasures of State, Maryland's Art Collection. We're going to be taking you sort of on a virtual tour of the show and telling you about how it came to be, how the show gets put together, and by that I mean logistics, and then also we'll be looking at selected objects as well. So it's great to have you all along tonight. Before I, uh, before we start, I would just like to let you know of a couple of upcoming events at the museum. On Friday, September 8th, we have Paint and Sip, and this is a program in which you will learn how to create traditional Norwegian rose milling with Lise Lorentzen. And basically what she's going to do is lead guests in painting a wooden heart-shaped project um, in Norwegian style. And that will be uh, that day from 5 to 7.30 p.m. You can call the museum if you want more information or look at our website. Then also on Saturday, September 9th from 4 to 6, we have a concert called Sounds of Landscape with Hiroya Tsukamoto, a composer and innovative acoustic guitarist, will take the crowd on a musical journey oh. inspired by landscapes. So it's going to be uh, a very nice uh, series of programs. And then finally, on Thursday, September 14th, at 5.30 p.m., the hidden history of Claire McCardle, Modern Design and the Birth of American Fashion, a lecture by author Elizabeth Evitz Dickinson in which she will discuss fashion icon designer and Frederick Native McCardle, who made revolutionary designs that helped women live independent lives. And that's in conjunction with our special installation of Claire McCardle's uh, dresses from the museum's collection. So those are all really exciting and great programs that we uh, are uh, hope that you can attend if you're able to. So without further ado, what I would like to do is share on my screen with you. What? We'll begin. I should also add that feel free to add questions in the chat as we uh, go through. Uh, sometimes in the past, as some of you know, we have stopped and taken questions. If not, if you prefer to ask at the end, that's fine too. Okay. So this was really an interesting exhibition, Treasures of State, and I really encourage you to come and see it, both of Sarah and I do. It interprets the history and scope of art collections from the Maryland State Archives in Annapolis, and it combines them with the holdings of the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts. It offers the public access to works of fine and decorative arts owned by the state that are rarely seen outside of Annapolis. So if you come to the museum, you're going to be able to look at some works of art and also historic artifacts that typically are put away. They're in government buildings. Uh, some of them are even um, stay much of their lives in storage. So this is really a special opportunity to see over 90 American paintings, American and European paintings, sculptures, works on paper, decorative arts uh, ranging in the 17th, 18th centuries to the present. So this is really a, an exciting show. And Sarah and I are going to tell you a lot more about it uh, tonight. So you might ask yourselves, where does the show begin? Um, well, it, it starts uh, at least uh, be, as being a curator um, with a checklist. And with a meeting in this exhibition, that's how it started. It started as an idea that was suggested by the former chairman of the Maryland Commission on Artistic Property named Matthew Lumia, as he suggested that the state and other museums uh, organize an exhibition in particular attention to Washington County Museum of Fine Arts. And it evolved from that concept into this exciting special show. 
And uh, how else, uh, Sarah, in, in terms of your your area of expertise and your work, do you see where does the show start and how do we get from that concept all the way to the finished product? Yeah, that's a really great question. I came on board at the Washington County Museum of Fine Art about a year and a half ago. So there had already been a lot of pre-planning because uh, as I recall, Daniel, the show was going to happen before the pandemic hit and then that delayed it. So when I came on board, there was an already a big idea of what they wanted to be a show. And, and as a designer and a collections manager, that's kind of always the first thing you work with is what do the curators want the public to come away with having learned? And so once I have that idea, the curators will give me a checklist of the objects and I will go through it because at first there may not necessarily be they haven't gotten to the level necessarily of doing a script, so they may not know what order they want them in, per se. So I will look at the objects themselves. A lot of times, if I can, I really prefer to look at them in person, especially paintings, since photography can change colors a bit. And some items don't show as much detail as we have one um, frame in here, for example, and a picture looks very flat, and Daniel will talk about it later. But when you see it in person, it's very, very elaborate lattice work type item. And that can impact how and where you display it. So the first thing I do is I look at how many objects do I have? What are their different sizes? And what Daniel is showing you right now is the floor plan and the entrance elevations. So the floor plan I generally look at, this show went into our grow gallery, which has the benefit of having movable walls in it and has about 24 of them. So the first thing I did is I knew I couldn't have a storage unit in there anymore and I'd have to use up just about every single wall we had. So that's where you kind of start. And as you're looking through the objects and you're scaling them, apparent themes will come out complementary objects that basically you will see the objects talk to each other very well. They complement each other very well. And so you see what has to go in a case, what maybe doesn't have to go in a case and how things have to be displayed. And through that, you will start to form a natural design and floor plan for the visitor and making it accessible. And the graphics in the layout for each of our special exhibitions, we want to make it unique to that particular show. And so the floor plan will change, the colors will change, the branding will change. Now, this is the entry sign and that's some of our branding. I'll look at all of the images that are in it and come up with several that quintessentially encapsulate the big idea of the exhibition. This is one of them, which is about the founding of Maryland, even though it's technically about the signing of the order of uh, religious, um, what was the last of the title? Religious tolerance, wasn't it, yes, Daniel? The religious toleration for Catholics and, pro and, and also Protestants later. So you have to think about things when you're doing the burning, such as what looks good horizontal, what looks good vertical for banners, for invitations what is kind of catchy because your most important item in your show may not necessarily be the one that's going to get people through the doors because it's it just grabs your attention instantaneously so this was one the color came from a lot of the objects that are in the show as well as the font type so i'll look at literally hundreds of different fonts to find something and usually i try to tie it into the show in some way this One's kind of a treasure map type font tying into the whole theme of hidden treasures at the state of Maryland and in our vault that are now coming out to be shared with the public. And then once we do this, I share this with Daniel and the director and our exhibition team, and I get feedback from them and adjust it as needed. And these sorts of things are generally done anywhere from six months to eight months to a year before the show even opens. Yes, and it, what it does is it provides us with a with a concept, with a a look, and uh, branding as well for the entire exhibition. It all ties together. 
Now, once we have a checklist, um, a final checklist, and we have completed all of our loan agreements, in this case, it was with the Maryland State Archives, our colleagues, Elaine Rice Bachman, who's the state archivist, and Christopher Kinsel, who's the curator of collections, and also their colleague, Catherine Rogers Arthur, who used to be the curator for the Maryland State Archives. Once we finalized those choices, we then uh, made arrangements to have the work shipped here. And that is also a very important part of the process, as Sarah can also tell you, is our shipping and completing condition reports is critical as we get ready to do the installation. Yeah, and some of the pictures here, this is the fine art handling company that the state hired and uh, my co colleague, Chris Prince was the one who worked on the state side. He's their collections manager to condition report because that, it's important. You want to know what the state of something is before it comes to your institution or your leaves your institution. So each individual item before it's packed has to be carefully reviewed, any marks noted, anything to the frame, the front, the back, anything that was previous damage so that when it comes, we know exactly what happened and, and condition it's in. And then when it leaves, we will do another condition report usually. And we always hope that it's no visible change to the item. And so they came and they helped to unpack the state, which had, I believe, a little over 60 items that came to the museum over a course of two days. And then here, my fine art handlers in-house helped to unpack some of their items, as well as bringing all of our items up from the vault that we had, which was about 35 that, or so that complemented the show. And some items you have to do a lot of careful planning for. The image you're seeing here are two marble busts that the state wanted to include. And for several weeks gave me a lot of sleepless nights thinking about how do you reinforce the case to hold these items because both of them are very heavy and had been designed to be displayed in the same case. And you'll see the one is already in the case and elevate it. And that's on a hardwood plinth for the exhibit. And under that's a thing called MDF, which is multi-density fiberboard, which has that size. You have to understand even as a collection manager and a register, because I also do the exhibition design, I have to understand how much weight can that hold. And so I have to do those calculations and then adjust the case accordingly so that it can safely accommodate these items to be on display. I also have to think about what height are they displayed at because I want to make sure that the objects are as accessible to being seen as can be to people of all ages. And so these two items went on and there we are installing the Hamilton and then the Pocahontas one is displayed next to it. Yes, and note how when the Pocahontas here by the sculptor John Mosier came to the museum, it's sort of in a harness there, right, sir, that, so that it won't move around in its, its um, crate, its box. Yeah, it actually transported directly from them because it was the same day, one shipment on the same truck. So it wasn't shared with any other institution's items. And they it's padded all under in foam and then harnessed onto it. And so it didn't move at all when it came. Now, one that you had told me about, Sarah, that was particularly challenging, and we'll talk about the painting a little more afterwards, was the Sharp family uh, by a British artist. Yeah, this painting is, as you could tell in the picture, huge, and it's very heavy because of the ornate wood frame on it, and it had been on display for decades in the governor's house and hadn't really come off the wall since, I think they said, the 40s. So they were very excited to kind of bring it down to eye level so that they can see the details themselves. Because as Daniel was saying, the state, a lot of their collections, they don't have a museum like we do to show these items. A lot of them are in government spaces and public spaces and offices in the governor's house. And so they have to see it as it's installed in those places. And so our walls, we typically don't display items that are this big. And so when it came, we had to accommodate our system. You can see in the back, we have usually a rail with 
rods that we hang items from, as do most museums. But this painting required a special type and about six people to be able to install it safely and get it on the wall. Yes, this, this one certainly is a challenge. And also look at the elaborate plaster work that's also gilded here on the frame. That's another thing. It's very fragile when it is transported in its crypt. Yeah, so. this it's so fragile they transported it in a thing that's called a travel frame, which basically it's a large crate that the painting has special hardware placed on the back of it and it's secured to the crate so that there's no packing material over it because even the slightest jarring of that on those rosettes could damage the gilding or damage further to actually pop pieces of it off, which is something we do not want to happen because we want this painting to be as pristine as it is here today, to have it this way in a thousand years for people to see. Yes, it's quite a painting. And uh, it's it's amazing that we have it uh, on display at the museum right now. It's one of the fine examples in the exhibition. Now, how the exhibition is divided up is into 10 sections and the first one is it deals with the founding of Maryland. This exhibition focuses, of course, on the artwork, but it also talks about the history of Maryland and the relationship between Maryland history and national history. So as you go through each of the sections, you'll be able to explore these different areas and eras. So it's roughly from the 1600s in the first section here when you enter the Royal Gallery through the early 19th century. So when you step in, the space. There you could see the sharp family right on the wall. There are numerous other pieces, including the Tompkins Madison, the founding of Maryland here, and a John Fessler tall case clock here from the late 1700s that was made in Frederick, Maryland. Then when you sort of back up in the space, you look at the second section, which is the uh, federal era. And then you have, once you turn the other way, that it's accompanied by some furniture made in Annapolis. You come into a little nook, which is about the Civil War in Maryland. And if you round the bend here, as you can see, you enter into the landscape section. So here you'd be going into the third segment. And then we have the fourth one here, which deals with Maryland and Baltimore landscapes. This wall here is a continuation of this one over here, which deals with the Civil War. And that would be, I think, roughly section six. And then you come into seven, which looks at notable Marylanders. So here we're going through the 1800s and coming up actually into the 1900s once we look at various notable Marylanders, sort of the 19th to 20th centuries are combined here. And that's followed by another section that deals with, okay, I'm going to skip one, genre paintings and portraiture from the late 19th, which is this wall. And this one, Daniel, actually, if you can pull that one up, that's, it presents an interesting thing about installations, is that sometimes even though we do the layouts and know kind of where everything's going to generally be and how it fits in the gallery space, sometimes when we get the physical items here, we end up finding that things are more complementary in another place, like the portrait in the back there of the genres was actually on a different wall, but it was kind of fighting with some of the paintings and it just, it wasn't gelling really well. And the director and, and Daniel and I looked at it and we were just like, this, this isn't working, where can we put it? And we ended up moving some things around and putting it in the back and it ends up working out really well back there so sometimes exhibit installs kind of change a little bit on the fly when you're doing it you try to minimize that but you never eliminate all surprises that come during an install time exactly and sometimes with things on paper or not how they seem once you actually have them up on the wall <laughs> in the space and sometimes it's just not um, possible to be able to see the objects. This one was in Annapolis and we were doing a lot of installs and deinstalls, so it was hard for me to go over there. Sometimes they're on display across the country if it's something we're borrowing from uh, 
a firm that organizes traveling exhibitions. So all you have are the pictures and the dimensions. And then the last two sections of the exhibition are artists at home and abroad, which is a selection of landscapes, as well as drawings from artist sketchbooks that are really quite beautiful here. We'll get to those a little bit later. And it combines it showing American and European artists working in different places in Europe, but also in America. And what this exhibition is about is cre creating dialogues between different works in our collections. That's one of the things that we were looking for is how can we pair the works that we have with the things in the state's collection to tell a story. And this was really a fun part about uh, curating this. We also have the last section, which deals with the Peabody collection. And that's one thing that that gallery was a little bit of a challenge because paper is really fragile, especially if there's certain pigments or watercolors on them. They're very susceptible to fading under certain lighting conditions. And once those pigment colors gone, it's gone. You can't replace that. So you have to be very careful with them. The main way you do this is not only putting them in a case, but controlling the lighting levels, which requires to be very, very low. The tip, this gallery is about five foot candles, which is about the light from five candles if you lit it, which is pretty dark. So we tried to put up signs to explain because we're, we're very aware that that sometimes makes things a little bit difficult to see, especially with our older visitors, because if you're, in the age bracket that I am rapidly heading towards and you're 50 or above, your eyes start to change. And so the way you see color, the way you see depth is very different than somebody that's say in their twenties or their thirties who could easily see on this. But so we have to kind of balance between the two because not only are we responsible for interpreting these items and educating as part of our mission. Our mission is also to protect and preserve and keep these things. And as a collections person, I have to tend to think a little bit differently than most people. Most people tend to think in their own lifespans. And that's kind of what they plan for. I have to, as I said earlier about the thousand years, I have to plan that these items will still be here in a thousand years or more. And that I'm simply in a one link in a chain of custodians caring for the items and lighting levels is really important to that. So you kind of try to come up with ways to still make it accessible. Sometimes it's through graphics where you blow up parts and make it bigger and a little easier for people to see. Sometimes it's handouts, but you always want to make sure that the visitors understand why are the lights so low because that's something you're always going to going to hear and cumulative light levels are are very damaging. So this gallery was a bit challenging compared to the others. They could have higher light levels. It looks like Elizabeth um, raised her hand. Did you have a question or a comment? Well, I have a question in general. Um, some of these old paintings that you have, I have seen the exhibition once and I will be back in a week or so. <clears throat> and you have the music there. Um, at that time, when those paintings were done, um, they could did not have the way that we can control today the temperatures in the rooms that you have and what have you. And um, so how did they preserve these paintings then? Did they have to be, particularly the old ones at the beginning when you walk in, the big paintings that you have there, <clears throat> how did they do that And um, at that time? and then bring it into the future. I mean, today we have all these techniques. We know the right temperatures and all this. Uh, did some of them have to be restored? Uh, yes. Brightened up again and what have you? Yes, actually several of the pieces that were in the show were actually conserved for the state. And we had some, um, I don't think for this show, but in the Legends and Landscapes we did, I believe. And then because oil, paintings are a lot sturdier than acrylics and such. So most of the time when they're up and they're being, they have smoke 
or they've turned yellow, that is the varnish that's happening that does that. And so when a, you get a properly trained conservator looks at it, they can restore the items. And a lot of times that will require conservation, which is very uh, laborious and take can take up to a year for a painting. This is one that uh, Daniel can speak about that the state had to conserve to have in the show. Yes, this would be an example of one where it was the conservation was critical. This is the state of the picture. The, the paint had cracked so severely that it had almost separated into sections. Um, and so it had to be completely uh, mended. And this is the final result, which is amazing. It's basically totally reconstituted um, and uh, brought back to life. Not only was it dirty, it was it suffered from severe paint, uh, active paint movement. So yeah. this is by the Maryland artist Thomas Hovenden. And it shows a daughter who's uh, reading to her parents. So this this is an extreme one, which is a testament to the fact Beautiful. of what conservators can do when they reline and in paint. And many of them are artists themselves. And I know the conservator they went to for all these pieces had the additional rarity that he conserved and can repair the paintings frames, which a lot of them are original and are generally create it to complement the painting at the time. So that's how a lot of those are able to be preserved and restored. Okay. Okay. Yes, yeah. yes, this is a beautiful work. Thomas Hovenden is, is a uh, uh -huh. very talented artist. Um, yeah. He was a 19th century genre painter and these are um, people uh, from Brittany, actually. He spent a lot of time there in France. And so, sometimes oh. you're, you're not even aware of how bad a painting is. We have two that we conserved that are now on display in our lobby that were cleaned. And there mm -hmm. are elements that are in the painting that you didn't really see, correct, Daniel, until it was cleaned? Yes. Yeah. The detail? You mean the detail? detailing and the darkness of the varnish the obscured detail. some of it mm -hmm. yeah and so but a lot of times the paintings especially if they go generational and generational and then museums people just that's how it's always looked yeah yes another one that was conserved from what i recall was the jacques yeah. antoine volet uh, who was a french artist this one if you come to the uh, exhibition. It's among my favorites. Night scene, conflagration on a lake, 18th century. Mm -hmm. Oh, this one here, yeah. Yeah, and it's got a incredible the light. Incredible the light. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, and see, that is something that I was talking about, like the varnish, if you have on it, and, and it can obscure that ship on the left could have easily been obscured out of the painting because of yes. the varnish age. Sure, yeah. So this was an occasion for the uh, Maryland State Archives to do some conservation, and that's often what happens with exhibitions, is that you're planning something and you're saying, we want this to look the best it possible it can, and if um, the budget permits, this is something that you look to do, because what better occasion than you're having an exhibition to have the works of art conserved? Um, and it helps to keep the collection at large preserved um, for future generations to enjoy. Sure. So the law painting, I'm sorry, where was that? You just showed a painting, um, but I don't see it now. I'm sorry. It's okay. We're going to keep We'll going. be going back to that slide. I know. Sorry. And then another important part of the uh, process is creating signage and labels. And this is um, very time consuming, but it's critical because it allows the um, visitor to understand what is the thesis or what are the ideas that we want to convey to the public. And Sarah Wolf plays a critical role in this because she designs it and makes it look uh, appealing. And um, Every show has to be different. 
So you change that by the size of the graphic, the orientation. This gave me the opportunity because there were so many wonderful paintings from our collection and the states in it that it gave me the chance to do blow ups of them so you could see much larger details of the paintings from that section. And then other times when I'm doing the graphics and things come up that are like, this would be really interesting to have too. And one of those was the timeline so that people would kind of understand where they are in time and space in that particular section. Yeah, we had a, um, a message in the chat about the Ken set. Uh, Philip, I hope to get to that one a little bit later of uh, the view of Windsor. And what's really neat is the details that Sarah pulled and brought into the uh, signage. Like here, this is a lovely detail. Um, from the founding. Continued on the bottom of the graphic. Yes. Because there's I, so much you have to think about when you're designing a graphic. You have to think about it, not only the font you use, but the size, how it lays out, the margins. So there's a great deal that goes into making it accessible to the most people that come through the doors to see the show. And hopefully you're encouraging them to read as much as you can because traditionally visitors only spend so much time in any gallery space you only have their attention captured for that so you want to make sure that you're able to through the design be subtle but also help to translate the curator's message so that the most amount of people under receive it yes and sometimes we come up with interesting ideas during the course of the exhibition at first we had not um, you know, set in stone that we would do timelines or, or, or historical bump outs, if you will. And this was something that came up in discussions. We said, you know, if we had timelines for, you know, that cover most of the sections, that would be really great. And so here's an example of the colonial era that has important dates in Maryland history, the founding of Maryland. And then also uh, here's from uh, America in historical context, 1850 to 80. And it's really neat to put this together because you get you get to you know pick out what do you think are the most important historical um, events or what is the chronology here and how does it relate to the works of art that we have on view. So having these timelines helps people to put everything in context. Yeah, and it's a big thing. You can't, as a museum, presume everybody who comes through your door is going to have that knowledge easily accessible. You want some people are going to be foreign visitors, some are going to be children who haven't learned it yet. So you want to be able to uh, to make sure that people can appreciate all of everything at the same level. Yes. As we were working on the actual installation, we had going concurrently the Treasures of State exhibition publication. And this is a very colorful and informative publication. We encourage you to purchase a copy. I believe it's $5 in the museum store. And when, when and if you come. So this was something that I worked on closely with uh, Mimi Calver, uh, who worked for many years in the Maryland State Archives, and uh, was helping out with this as a special project, in addition to working with Chris Kensel and um, Elaine Rice Bachman. And Sarah Wolf assisted by taking new photographs of works in our collection. And this was quite a bit of work to, to put this all together. It starts with you know, creating basic Microsoft Word documents and taking that to a, a fully designed publication. It goes but the nice thing is you can expand your content because you can only yeah. include so much on a gallery label to be as accessible as you want. And this, and how you write and what you write for a publication, what you write for in the gallery is a little different. So it's kind of double work for, for Poor Daniel there, but it does give us a lot to, to it's so hard what stories and, and what elements you choose to put in the gallery that this allows you a lot more versatility. Yes, but enjoyable nevertheless to put it together. And it also, the uh, publication acts as a testament. So even when the show comes down, 
we still have a record of it. And that's what's really nice when we can do a publication because we have a way of remembering it. So these are just some spreads from it. Which is important because even today we'll get calls and requests for information about an item that was on exhibition sometimes decades ago. Yes, it is very important. We, we certainly get historical inquiries. And uh, now uh, what uh, we'll do is we'll go through each of the sections and we're going to talk about some of the highlights. And, um, you know, we'll also talk about other logistical issues that may come to bear on these as well. Um, so some of my, one of my favorites is the Tompkins Madison, which is a fanciful <laughs> depiction of the founding of Maryland um, in March, 1634. What's sort of amusing about this painting, but not surprising given the mid 1800s, the Romantic era, is that the people who are <laughs> depicted in this, um, including Cecil Calvert, uh, never set foot in Maryland. So it's the 19th century looking back to the 17th century. Um, this here is uh, showing Cecil Calvert, Lord Baltimore, standing next to Father Andrew White, who uh, left the colony by 1645, this uh, minister here. And he's handing over the act of toleration to William Stone, the colonial governor. So it's interesting how the artist creates his own interpretation of the events. And notice how everything is so harmonious with the Native Americans. When, in fact, it probably was not this way at all if we went back to the 1630s, perhaps at the beginning, but certainly there were conflicts after that. And you'll notice up here that he puts in the coat of arms of the Calvert and Crossland families, which today is on the Maryland flag. What this exhibition also does is it brings together traditional works of art by history painters like um, Tompkins Madison. And you have this beautiful um, beaded flag that was created by uh, Bear Claw of the Cherokee Nation. And it consists of some 74,000 individual beads. Uh, this is an artist working in Harford County, Northeastern Maryland. So this is really beautiful and very fitting for the theme of the exhibition. The show also tries to bring in stories of, in, of important individuals, including women and um, people of color as well. Um, on the right here is Margaret Brent, who was one of the earliest proponents of empowering women in uh, colonial America. And she arrived in 1638 in Maryland with several sibling, siblings, and she received a land grant from her cousin, Cecil Calvert. She became very important because she went to court to collect her family's debts. Uh, she also became a landowner. And also the first to, to appear before the Maryland Assembly when she requested two votes, one for herself and the other as executor for uh, her other cousin, Leonard Calvert's estate. He was uh, another colonial governor of Maryland. So she has a very important role in early history of the state. Of course, Maryland is named after Henrietta Maria, uh, Queen of England and the wife of Charles I. Here you can see the display of the Sharp family. He was another colonial governor. And next to it is the portrait of George Washington. And what's curious about this painting is that uh, and we actually see uh, Governor Sharp over here, but this depicts him in his family's huge estate back in England. So the painting ended up here, ended up in the United States, but it doesn't depict him in his colonial residence. So it's looking back to the his, his ancestral home in England. And a firm attribution has actually not been put on this painting. Some have said it's by an artist named Arthur Devis, but um, it's still debated today whether or not Devis actually did it. It's a really interesting painting. It's called a conversation piece. And by that, it means a society portrait of various aristocrats who are gathered in a room. And you have uh, aspects of domestic life and leisure over here. There's music making. The dogs here are with this man, and it's about polite conversation. So it's great that we have that. And another thing that we do uh, when we have exhibitions is we do something called collection connections. And this is really a great example 
the sharp family, and this was like as Sarah was saying before, that happens kind of spontaneously. I said, you know something? We have a painting that is thematically very similar in the collection, and it hasn't been out for a long time. Ours is a copy after the Strode family by William Hogarth. And you'll see that this painting, which is the original is in the Tate Gallery in London, bears a close resemblance to the kind of theme that you see in the shark family. The thing I love about them is the environments also that they show is that you know you kind of in the sharp see a peak of another room with the art in there and you see the painting up there on the wall and so you kind of get a little bit of look into what their aesthetic was that they liked and had at that time yes and in many cases these aristocrats in england like a lot of their peers they would um, travel on the european continent they were art collectors and they're showing their wealth and their good taste. And you see that here with the Strode family as well. So when you come down the hall of the museum after you pass the, the front lobby, this painting is on view outside the exhibition. And it has a little um, label that Sarah has made called Treasures of State Collections Connections. And we have those throughout the museum for both shows because we, want people to come and see these new exhibits, but we also, if they haven't been here for a while or they haven't been here at all, we want to make sure that they come and look at our permanent collection items. This also allows us to create re visual relationships and connections to works in the collection that we can't possibly fit all of them in the gallery. So this was really um, enjoyable to be able to do this every time we have a show where we have those relationships. We also have connections between artists themselves. Here's John Heselius's portrait of Sophia Dorsey, who is an early Marylander. And here we have a Charles Wilson Peale, a very famous um, likeness of George Washington. As it turns out, John Heselius was one of Charles Wilson Peale's teachers when he was getting his basic artistic training. So it's really neat to be able to make these connections. Heselius worked in Maryland, Colonial Maryland and Virginia. And this is an interesting one because look at these little faces on the spandrels of the portrait. Um, some scholars have argued that these allude to Charles Wilson Peale's sons, uh, perhaps Raphael Peale. Um, it could be another one of the sons who may have had a hand in painting the picture uh, for our first president. So it's, it's kind of a little visual pun that he, he put in there. You normally don't see those sorts of things because it would have been covered with a gilded uh, oval over that. And so he like Daniels, that might have had them testing their abilities since it would be hidden anyway. There are also other notable Marylanders that are uh, displayed here, including uh, John Hansen. He's one of them. And Hansen was uh, an imp uh, important with the um, original uh, Articles of Confederation. Um, of course, then being adopted in Annapolis. So he is very important uh, in that regard. He's also sometimes considered the first president. And this is a statue that was made quite some time later, uh, in 1905, looking back at famous um, people in Maryland history. In terms of the collection connections with uh, Charles Wilson Peale, we have Colonel Nathaniel Ramsey, who uh, knew Washington. Uh, Washington actually sent him to serve in the Battle of Monmouth. Originally from Pennsylvania, he uh, eventually settled down after the war in Cecil County, Maryland, which is northeastern Maryland. But he was captured at the Battle of Monmouth and he was taken prisoner. And Washington actually had to work to secure his release from the British. And in addition to that, Nathaniel Ramsey uh, became an attorney and the first U.S. Marshal of Maryland later in his life. He was also the brother-in-law of the artist. So there are really neat connections here. And this is Sarah's concept with a collection connections that you can see on top of the main label, pointing you to other members of the Peel family that we have in the collection.
this was also a particularly interesting uh, a problem, or if you, if you will, or a challenge, uh, was a sword. And uh, perhaps, uh, Sarah, you can share with us how that was uh, uh, resolved or installed. Yeah, a lot of times the shows we do don't necessarily always have three-dimensional objects, or they have objects that, like our glass collection, kind of stand on their own, and you just need to elevate them. But sometimes you get objects that when you lay it in a case flat, it looks flat. It doesn't come to life at all. It's a little difficult for the visitor to see. And so we are super, super fortunate that we have this gentleman who is a professionally trained mount maker and he makes the different armatures that can elevate something. And there's, there's certain rules and guidelines that you follow for what angles you put them on, how far away from what we call the deck or the base of the exhibit. And this one, the sword not only has these beautiful etchings and engravings that are on the blade, they also have a very elaborate scabber. And so we knew that we wanted to display the items vertically up and separate so that people would be able to see them, but they're also, it presented the challenge of the elements are rather small and can be very difficult to see. And that's one of the ways that you can use graphics to help blow items up so that you can see some of that detail. The presentation engraving on it, for example, is so small that even looking at the physical piece outside the case, it's a little difficult to read exactly what it says, but once you blow it up, it is something that you can see. And then it also had the series uh, near the tongue along the blade and at the tip it had seen different scenes that were related to the history of Maryland. And this was kind of common, the War of 1812, the new government made several small sword presentation sabers for different members of the military. So this is one of the ways that we came to a solution for this problem. Yes, this particular example, um, was commissioned by the Maryland General Assembly in 1832 for colonel, uh, excuse me, Nathan Towson, um, he, as a testimony to um, the admiration and gratitude of his uh, native state for uh, service during the War of 1812. And he was born in Towson, Maryland, and he uh, rose to the rank of major during the war. He was particularly courageous in capturing the ship HMS Caledonia. So it was made in his um, honor. You'll also note that the sword's hilt has is decorated with stars, and um, it notes the different battles in which Towson fought. So all these details work together uh, to, to commemorate this individual. It also is connected to the Maryland Seal of 1794, which was designed by Charles Wilson Peale. So as you're looking at the sword, you've got a Charles Wilson Peale painting on view in the same space. We also have a Joseph Mosier sculpture of Pocahontas and Giuseppe Ciaracchi's bust of Alexander Hamilton. In the background there is a portrait by Raphael Peale of uh, Governor Samuel Sprigg and his wife, Violetta Lansdell Sprigg. I should add that this is the final um, product of what Sarah was talking about before in terms of um, making sure that the deck and the case can support the weight of these very heavy sculptures. And especially, you know, you'll note with the Pocahontas that it's a very Europeanized version of what was a 14-year-old girl. Yes. She's depicted as a classical goddess or perhaps a personification. So it's very idealized and typical of that time, almost going in at that point with uh, Joseph Mosier. It is the almost, the, it's still within the Romantic era. It's also a period in which the neoclassical style is still being used. But that's not how she looked. Can I ask a question? Sure. 
I'm sorry to interrupt, but why did you put those two together? I remember when I saw well, it, I thought it was, and not another woman next to her, like um, you have another aesthetic. There are, are a couple design issues that came up with it. One is that they're a similar material and look, and they're together in that time period, part of that gallery. We also only had, this was a very case heavy exhibition and there were a lot of items that needed to be in a case. And I only had so many. So the fact that they could be put together saved me from having another case to actually have in the gallery space as well. So sometimes it's necessity of what you have to work with physically that leads to some things being suggested to be put together and not. What was uh, very neat was when we were picking out the objects was to see that we had the same governor of Maryland depicted by two peels. On the right, Charles Wilson, who's the father of Raphael. But this shit is done by Charles Wilson Peel much later in his life, which uh, was quite interesting to pair with how his son depicts him. I find this one to be much more lively. This is more traditional. You have a column here. You have a curtain, which you know displays grandeur, and then a view of the landscape in the background. And what's interesting is Charles Wilson Peel painted Spriggs' portrait there on the right over a three-day visit to Northampton Estate, which was uh, in Prince George's County, when the artist was 83 years old. And at the time, Peel wrote to Thomas Jefferson after finishing it, and he said, and I quote, I believe my powers to produce good portraits is greater than formerly. Although the imagination of an aged man may not be so sprightly, yet the judgment may be better. So he thought that old age brought more insight into his um, subject, which is kind of neat. And to see how the older artist uh, looks at depicting the same man. And Sprigg actually grew up in Washington County. But after his father died, he was adopted by his uncle, who um, whose name was Osborne Sprigg, and he brought him down to Prince George's County. So he lived a life in Western Maryland and then closer to what's today DC. And I'm showing him very distinguished and fashionable as well as his wife, Violetta. And in these days, these kind of portraits were meant to be hung on the wall like this, and the two people face one another. We also have a really fine section in the exhibition of landscapes that surveys, uh, in some parts, the development of American landscape painting from Hudson River School works, like Jasper Francis Cropsey's Autumn on the Hudson, New York, to works uh, that are sort of more in the uh, a dreamier style that seeks to establish a mood called tonalism. While we couldn't put our Cropsey Autumn landscape in the same space, we did create a collection connection with this little label. And again, the connections that we have among our collections are just really outstanding. Henry Livingston Hillier, we have the largest number of works by this artist in the museum. And this depicts November on Rock Creek, which is what's today in Rock Creek Park. And I remember, Sarah, when I was working on researching this and I said to you, do you know anything about the bridge? Remember that discussion? And then you sort yeah. of- Yeah. Yeah, we were able to look it up and see pretty much the vantage point that Hillier would have stood at to create this painting. Yes. It could be either Bluff or Boulder Bridge um, in the park. So that's kind of neat, too, as we were looking um, at preparing the show. Of course, back then it had these haystacks. It was still quite agricultural. Yeah, most of D.C. at that rain. It was very small and condensed and had a, a lot of unplanted or an undeveloped uh, land around it. In the museum, we also have Maryland artist Hugh Bolton Jones, who grew up in Baltimore. And the state has several really lovely ones, including A Quiet Morning that was conserved, which uh, exactly where it was painted, it's hard to know. It could be somewhere in Virginia, it could be Maryland. This one, the Upper Potomac, likely West Virginia. 
uh, where you know, Hugh Jones did travel up that way uh, from 1871. He loved to paint cattle, particularly in the really, um, stillness of the water, contrasting with the beautiful works. Some artists experimenting more with tonalism, Charles Folkmar, who ended up going over to France and joining an artist uh, called the Barbizon School. This one is very idealized. That's in the state collection with a lone stag uh, looking like it's preparing to drink here from the uh, spring. And then ours, which uh, shows the upper gunpowder uh, in Baltimore County, Northern Baltimore County. We also have George Innes, though not in the exhibition. These are two spreads from the catalog. The Storm by, from the state's collection is on view, as well as Dwight Tryon's Morning, which has a collection connection to Dwight Tryon's Night. And these are more in the tonalist style, like I was saying before, that creates a real atmosphere or a mood. There's also a section devoted to really beautiful Baltimore scenes. This one on the left by William Henry Bartlett, the original painting from which the print in our collection is made on the right. It's neat to look at these and try to find what are the differences between the original and the print made by Samuel Fisher. Printmaker has added these people to the left here and altered a number of things that we don't see in the original uh, picture. We also have the viaduct on the Baltimore Washington Railway. This is the Thomas Viaduct, and it goes between Relay and Elk Ridge, Maryland, in Howard County. And it still carries the railroad today. It's one of the oldest such bridges still in operation in the country. It was designed by um, Benjamin Henry Latrobe, who designed the Baltimore Basilica, our first Catholic cathedral that's also in Baltimore. At the time, these kind of prints were really important because many people couldn't afford paintings. So prints could be easily purchased and hung in a, a parlor or any other part of somebody's home for them to look at. And that was really helped the artists to spread uh, their name. And once you've gone through the Baltimore and Maryland landscape sections, you will come to a sort of transitional piece and a really key one by John Rogers called the Council of War. And uh, Sarah and I were talking about this one earlier today. It's, it's a fascinating sculpture. Yeah, it was one of his first. He actually started off sculpting realistic forms like the Civil War in the 1860s and kind of grew from there and then started doing based on literature and myths and everyday life. And pretty much he was kind of the sculptor of the people. It was extremely popular in the 1870s and to the, about the 1890s to have a John Rogers in your house. Usually he made special pedestals for him that had claw feet. And this one was actually commissioned by Stanton himself, the uh, gentleman that's being shown there. And Rogers sat or went and they sat for him many times to get the faces of them correct and he looked at hundreds of pictures that he could find of Lincoln to get his face correct and actually it ended up that his son uh, said it was the best likeness of his father that they had. Rogers also had a bit of time with this piece because he ended up modeling it in three different ways throughout its existence. So Stanton provided the idea that this should happen and this is thought to be an articulation of a meeting in March 1864 right after Grant took over the Union uh, Army and Stanton was displayed with his hands further behind Lincoln's head and because of Stanton's personality which was very brusque there was speculation and rumors that were unconfirmed and later proven to be unfounded that he had involvement in the assassination of President Lincoln. 
And so there was kind of this demand by the public, depending on where these were purchased, that that be altered. And so he did a secondary one with Stanton's hands down, but the artist always found that that was very lifeless and flat and he didn't like it. So then he did this third model that showed Stanton cleaning his glasses, but further out and that kind of appeased everybody. Art historians have kind of countered also that that really had nothing to do with it, that it was more a logistical issue for how Rogers would make his plaster sculptures. So there's kind of a two thought, but most tend to think that it was because of uh, that perception of how it could be interpreted by the people who purchased this piece. And it's rather large and heavy. It was one of the bigger pieces that he ended up ever making. And it was also one of his pop, most popular ones. He priced it a little bit higher on his line. So originally it went for a very large sum of $25, which back then in the 1860s and 70s would have been many hundreds of dollars in our money today. Roger's attention to detail also, I always find it really extraordinary and beautifully done in plaster. Um, just a in, very interesting artist. In our collection, we actually have two Rogers sculptures um, coming to the Parson and Checkers up at the farm, which um, they were on view uh, several years ago. Also in the Civil War section, we have uh, a decorative Fifth Corps Brigade um, uh, uh, finial that you see here. It would have been put on top of a uh, standard uh, from that brigade in Maryland. So this and is... And this is one of the, the nice pieces that makes it a lot easier to mount it. It wouldn't sit on the deck because the base isn't perfectly level. And so it would want to fall over, which you don't want to happen in your exhibits. So, but because it had been on a pole, the entire interior was hollowed out. So we were able to make a special mold to not only elevate it up, but to keep it level so that you could see it. Yes, and it turned, the display really turned out very nice. It's a really fine object. In this section, there are also prints and photographs uh, depicting uh, the Civil War, battles from the Civil War. So Courier and I is one of the most famous printmakers and very widely distributed and very readily available to Americans, produced this Battle of Sharpsburg, Maryland on September 16th, 1862, right in Washington County. And it's a very dramatic scene, uh, certainly done in the Romantic style, showing the Union troops on the left advancing on the Confederates. It shows the horrors of war and the chaos of battle. But really very well done. And the, this is one of the wonderful things where you can see the contrast between the two because Matthew Brady is widely considered to be the first war photographer. And he saw this very new technology that could be used to accurately cover a situation. And he saw a need for it with the American Civil War. Before then, they had to be done by artists on battlefields who sometimes took some licenses and not. But when Brady's doing this in the 1860s, this is still a fledgling technology. I mean, the first daguerreotype was, in, was invented in 49, just 12 years earlier. And so he, he uh, hired many people who went out and took photographs, thousands of photographs of the entire war, which is why up until that point, it's one of the best recorded wars up until the in the 1800s. Indeed, Sarah. And this was also the first time using photography uh, that we, one of the first times that we see in America, at least, the um, depiction of corpses, the dead from battle, and the horrors of war coming home to people to be able to see these, which would have been presented in albums at the time. And then what Gardner does is he he photographs the battle in September just afterwards, and then he returns in October when Lincoln came to visit. And then he photographs Lincoln meeting with various people. And our museum has a series of these photographs 
by Alexander uh, Gardner that we've had since 1937 that actually came out of a studio that was sort of descended from Brady's original in Washington. These are, this is a selection of them. We also have another very colorful print. Uh, this is the kind of thing that was also produced as photography is um, becoming more and more common of the Battle of Antietam and the taking of Burnside Bridge in September 1862. When you come out of the Civil War section, you come into a notable Marylanders uh, area, uh, which has a number of individuals, including African Americans, to sort of diversify the narrative of the exhibition and to represent our history more accurately. Uh, Tony, uh, excuse me, Toby Mendez, who's a Washington County based artist, uh, did this maquette of Thurgood Marshall, famous Supreme Court justice. That it, so, maquette being the small version for the larger one that's down in Annapolis outside the legislative buildings. Brandon Thorpe O'Neill's beautiful bust of Harriet Tubman. She's shown at a younger age. And the base is made out of white oak from the eastern shore of Maryland, from, from trees there. And that, of course, is she was born in Dorchester County, Maryland. And then in the background there is a painting by Lisa Edgeley of Gwendolyn Britt, who is an important civil rights activist and state senator from Prince George's County, Maryland. And she stands in front of the Glen Echo um, Park, where she was not allowed to enter back in the, I believe it was the year 1960 or 61. And she became very active in the civil rights movement. Closer to home, we have here a depiction of our former board president, Theron Reinhardt, who was the board president from the mid 1980s through the early to mid nineties. Um, so this is him playing solitaire with his cats around him. It's a really lovely piece. And then on the lower right, former First Lady Yumi Hogan, a beautiful painting called Early Morning Backyard Two. And the Museum of Fine Arts, Washington County had an exhibition of her work in 2018. So it's most appropriate. This section uh, here, and um, I do see the time here. Uh, so we'll, soon we will um, wrap things up, but this section also presented interesting problems. We talked about the Hovenden, um, we also show connections between the artist Thomas Dewing, the painting in the state's collection, and a beautiful pastel drawing we have here on the right. The frame in the state's collection is actually designed by architect Stanford White. And then up here is a little photo of Dewing, who I think you, you, you were telling me today, Sarah, that this uh, woman here is model. I believe she was a she was an actress. An she, actress. At the time, he used her in several of his pieces. Yes. And many of Thomas Dewing's frames were designed by the architect Stanford White of McKinn, Mead, and White. And that's him down there. So there's a collaboration between an architect and a designer and a painter. Did you say something about the frame? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. That, the frame. And that's one it's of the incredibly things. incredibly beautiful. Yeah. Well, it doesn't really show up very well in this photograph, but it's no, it, what I saw it actually the lattice work mm -hmm. and the, how hollow it is. It, it's just incredibly yeah. intricate and yeah. elaborate frame. Yeah. It's stunning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very stunning when you stand in front of it. <laughs> Dewing's work is very dreamy and, and beautiful. And another highlight, and also deals with issues of display, is uh, the Samuel Kirk and Sons uh, uh, series of sil silver objects, particularly the vegetable dish for Washington County. And this was a huge commission. Samuel Kirk and Sons was a major silver, Smith silver maker in Baltimore. And they were charged with making silver objects to be placed on US warships in the year 1906 for all 23 Maryland counties. Um, and that must have been quite a job. So th this vegetable dish has various scenes on it. Originally, 
this was placed on the um, vessel called Maryland, an armored cruiser. And that's what it looks like there on that little detail. But you see landmarks from Washington County on it. The Captain Moses Cabin, the Dunker Church at Antietam Battlefield. You can see it in Gardner's photo on the right. And then a detail of the CNL Canal or just some of the scenes. It's really fun to go through and try to identify these. And then we have a USS Maryland uh, Silver Service roast platter for Howard County, which shows the Thomas Viaduct here. Tooling on that is just remarkable. Possibly based off the print, but I don't know for certain. I know that prints were used, though, with some of the imagery. And then here's a detail of Ellicott's Mills. Today, it's Ellicott City. We also have in that section beautiful still life paintings by Andrew Way, who was a Baltimore uh, still life artist known for his depictions of grapes. And the state has a really wonderful one of apples here. And then this is one in our collection. These two are both in our collection of nuts and wine, with the chair in the background, and then the grapes and the wine and the peaches. There, uh, Philip is the John Kensett on the Thames near Windsor, which is a beautiful scene. Possibly painted when he was abroad, but more likely when he came back to America from sketches. And we have in that section also some really beautiful works. This is another one of my favorites in the show, David Law's Gondolas in Venice at Twilight. This is just a remarkable. Yeah, that's the one I saw earlier, and I wondered about this particular painting. Uh, the, the, the etching? So, so it was done by the mailender? No, was this one the... here, no. This is by David Law. He was an English artist oh. from Scotland. So this section basically blends together American and European artists, including this really nice Eastern shore scene, the oyster season um, at Sinopuxet Bay, which is today near Ocean City. It's another one of my favorites. Beautiful light. Or Clavett Spangler's view of Fairview Mountain. Claggett Spangler actually was a um, friend of our founder, William Singer. Um, when William Singer was courting other co-founder of the museum, Anna Singer, uh, his to-be wife, he went on sketching trips with Claggett Spangler in Washington County. The Spangler style is very different from Singer's. And that shows Fairview Mountain, which is near Clairsburg. Or John Robinson Tate's old sawmill which shows a sawmill that's sort of fallen on hard times at long after this kind of uh, logging has been replaced by machinery. This is showing a place where it would have been done by hand. Very nostalgic, beautiful painting. And then some sketches by Henry Livingston Hillier paired with one of his scenes along the Chesapeake Bay. Or Kenyon Cox, when he was studying abroad, he was a famous American muralist looking at Francisco Goya. That's another page that's within the book. And then finally, at the end of the exhibition, we have a section, the, the Peabody Collection, which is named after George Peabody, a famous American philanthropist who founded the Peabody Institute, which is today part of Johns Hopkins University but originally it was founded to have an art gallery, a uh, concert hall, and um, uh, also, a, as I recall, a library and archives that would serve for the um, education of people in Baltimore and in Maryland. So Peabody left his mark indeed. And after he died, uh, the Institute started to collect art and they formed an actually a very large collection of paintings and sculptures, some of which are on view in the exhibition, like the Pocahontas sculpture, it was part of the original Peabody collection. And in this section, we have a number of beautiful 
drawings and prints. The drawings from the state are from the Eaton collection, which were uh, collected in the mid 1800s, and we paired them with works that we have. So we have in our collection of Piranesi, who's an Italian etcher, really remarkable detail in this work of the uh, Arch of Constantine. And that is paired with the Arch of Titus, which is not very far away. In fact, it's just down the hill here towards the Colosseum, and you go left. So this is before the Arch of Titus was restored in Rome. Or this view of a mosque by um, Alexandre Gabriel de Caen, just beautiful, wonderful. And as Sarah was saying before, these works are really light sensitive. So this is a rare opportunity for them to come out of storage. Um, from the, at the state's facility and to be displayed in a museum context. And again, the themes are really fabulous. So the Trinity with saints here by Domenico Bruno, we paired it with uh, the adoration of the Holy Trinity that's in our collection. There's also an ascension that relates to our uh, Benjamin West, which is on um, view in a neighboring gallery. or the adoration of the shepherds and the adoration of the Magi. So if uh, we'd be glad to take any additional questions that you have before we wrap it up tonight. I attended um, last Sunday or Saturday at Antietam. I volunteer at Antietam for 17 years. And anyway, they had a photographer there who could take pictures like they would have done when the right after the battle, two days after the battle, that particular painting that you showed, the famous one with the Dunker Church and the Fallen, uh, was taken two days later and then taken to New York. And uh, anyway, um, when there was a gentleman there who has done a lot of work with those painting, pictures that were taken. And apparently they were three-dimensional when they were first developed. We had to put on, at least he showed them three-dimensional, we had to put on glasses with green and red lenses in order to make it... The stereo views? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, and they, yeah, they were very popular. Is that what it, so that's what, uh, but originally the paintings, the, I'm sorry. Um, so those are photographed like that and then shown to the people like that, I guess. Yeah, they would have a special, it was almost like a wooden uh, contraption that you could put to your face and you could put the stereograph in and it would create yeah. that three dimensionality look. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he had quite a few of those in his presentation at Antietam. Okay. Well. Okay. Thank you very much. This was very, very interesting. You're very welcome. I couldn't paint anything, but I love art. <laughs> so. Great. Well, glad that you could come. And yeah. Oh, yeah. Join us. Yes. Thank you to everybody who came That's tonight. Okay. And we invite you to come back in, um, it will be, I believe, yes, October for another discussion on Pica about our upcoming Picasso exhibition called Picasso on Paper. Oops. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see here. Which is going to open on November 11th. So at that time, we'll have another Let's Talk Art edition about that. Thank you. Thank you very much for an interesting evening. You're very welcome. Well, thanks so much for everybody for coming and uh, we hope to see you next time. And thank you, Sarah. Anytime. It was lovely to join you, Alice.